More specifically, ah, yes, before I forget, this is going to be joint work. I'm going to explain joint work with Mohamed Abu Zaid, Alexander Efimov, Ludmil Kadzakov, and Dmitry Orlov. So the kind of mirror symmetry that we care about, especially, you know, if you know a little bit about non-compact Riemann surfaces, you know that there's not very many interesting non-constant closed genus zero curves in there. So that should tell you that, you know, Gromov-Witt invariants will not be very prominent there. So there's two flavors of mirror symmetry I want to t talk about. One is homological mirror symmetry in the sense of Konsevich. And so what this one says is that if I have a pair of mirror spaces, I will have to clarify what I mean by space soon, then, well, as, as we all know, the symplectic geometry of one is related to the complex geometry of the other, but the way in which we want to think about that is in the language of certain categories. So here, for example, thinking of X as symplectic, will have something called the Foucault category of X should be related, the technical term is called derived equivalent, to coherent sheaves on X check. And so specifically the objects of the Foucault category are Lagrangian submanifolds. And what we study when we look at Fouquet category is actually intersection theory for Lagrangian submanifolds, but deformed by holomorphic disks, just like quantum cohomology is the usual cohomology deformed by holomorphic spheres. So if, you know, this is very abstract. I mean, I'm going to try to be concrete by staying in dimension one. So this will be slightly less scary, but maybe I should say that this relates to the usual or other flavor of mirror symmetry. So to the story about gromov witten invariants and periods and all that, by taking something called the Horschild cohomology of these categories. So Horschild cohomology is a purely evil abstract algebra invariant of a category and it produces for you a graded ring. And well, that, you know, in the case of compact symplectic manifolds, this recovers the quantum cohomology. And if you start from coherent sheaves, then there's a result of Horschelt, Kostan, Rosenberg, which says that this recovers the algebra of polyvector fields, cohomology of polyvector fields, which on the Calabi-Yau would be the same as the usual cohomology, but with a different ring structure. Well, it's a lot of algebra, okay? I personally cannot compute too much of this. Now, what I'm going to do is actually focus on the open case, on the case on some, some open manifolds, and there this is going to be even more interesting because you don't want to think about the quantum cohomology when you do mirror symmetry for open manifolds. So in fact, I mean, before I say even more, Say so what kinds of non-compact Riemann surfaces will I deal with? Well, for simplicity in this talk, I will mostly think of the cylinder and the pair of pants. Okay, these are pretty good examples. And so this one is C star, and that's mirror to C star by mirror symmetry in any sense of the term. But now if you try to understand what are the natural rings you would want to think about, well, here, if you look at polyvector fields, that will be an algebra generated by, well, first of all, you have Laurent polynomials, which are the regular functions of this thing. And then you have DDZ, or maybe I should say Z, DDZ, or whichever way. And this one is, of course, an odd variable, which means if I square it, I get zero. This guy wedge itself is zero. So if you try to do any kind of usual cohomology or quantum cohomology, you're going to be in trouble because this is infinite dimensional. So instead, there's an invariant called the symplectic cohomology. Mm. 
which turns out to be isomorphic to this as a ring. And what this is, is a deformation, I mean, it's, no, it's a modification of the notion of, you know, roughly speaking, quantum cohomology counts j holomorphic spheres. And symplectic cohomology looks instead at perturbed holomorphic curves of genus zero, which are perturbed by some Hamiltonian vector field. And we'll see this vector field come up as well in the context of Fouquet categories. So in some sense, you know, I'm choosing this framework to explain things because I want to introduce you a little bit to it. But also what's interesting is this non-compactness and this kinds of slightly exotic objects here. And that's really what's you know, new in here. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to mention is another kind of neurosymmetry I'm interested in is the strominger yao conjecture. And this one is the one that tells you geometrically how you find the mirror to a given space. And well, you know, to take a line from Renzo's talk, uh, in mirror symmetry, is a, you know, it's much easier to have mirror pairs if you know a physicist. But if you don't want to just go and ask a physicist each time you want a new example to play with, then you want to understand what's the geometric way of building a mirror from something else. And so what this one says is that mirror dual pairs are dual Lagrangian torus vibrations over the same base. And so just to illustrate that very quickly, in the example of C star, well, you can think of C star, so it's the infinite cylinder. It's just a trivial circle bundle over the real line. And, well, I don't really want to spend too much time telling you what dualizing means. It means that I will replace each of these circles by some other dual circle. But essentially, I'll get another trivial family of circles over the real line, and that will be again C star. So far, this looks reasonable. Okay. So what I need to do is tell you a little bit more about these Fouquet categories, and then we'll be in good shape to try to understand homological mirror symmetry for C star, which is a reasonably classical case, but if you haven't seen it before, then it's probably an interesting one. Now, just before you know, we go into more details, Maybe I should point out why do I care about these two examples? Well, one is because there's some interesting new mathematical phenomena like this symplectic cohomology. But the other one is that I hope that these are building blocks for arbitrary Riemann surfaces, up to maybe compactifying by adding the disk. So in the perspective of the SYZ conjecture, we know actually how to assemble building blocks to build mirrors to completely arbitrary Riemann surfaces just out of these pieces. In the context of homological mirror symmetry, that's still a few years off. We don't really understand yet how to achieve this kind of functoriality. We only have little bits of it. Okay, but let me just remark that the cylinder, whoops, and a pair of pants are building blocks for general Riemann surfaces. So, all right. So the first thing I want to tell you is more about Fouquet categories and in fact about the kind of Fouquet categories that's useful to my setting, namely something called the wrapped Fouquet category. And because we'll be in dimension one, it's going to be pretty easy to explain just by pictures. This is something that's associated to an open, preferably exact for technical reasons, but there are ways to relax this a little bit, symplectic many. But I look at the one dimensional case for simplicity. 
So let's say that I will have, you know, some of an Riemann surface, and I want to think of it as having, I'm going to do symplectic geometry on it. So that means I have an area form, and I want to imagine that this area form is complete and has infinite cylindrical ends. Okay, so if there were boundaries in your mind, just complete them until you see infinite cylinders in all the non-compact directions. In higher dimensions, you would have a symplectic manifold with contact boundary, and you would attach the symplectization of this contact manifold. So now, the objects of the Wraff-Fouquet category are going to be properly embedded Lagrangian submanifolds which are conical or maybe I should say translation invariant outside a compact set. So what do I mean by that? Well, Lagrangian submanifold in dimension one is just any one dimensional submanifold and translation invariant means that in each cylindrical end it just goes to infinity in a straight way if it goes into that end at all. So an example of an object might be this kind of curve. Or, well, there's many others that you can imagine. Okay. So now, what I mentioned briefly is that morphisms in Fouquet categories look at intersections between Lagrangians. So in general, if you have two Lagrangian submanifolds, then you will build a chain complex whose generators are their intersection points, and you will try to build a homology theory on that that makes the whole story invariant under isotopies. Now, if you have non-compact Lagrangians, then you have a small problem with invariance under isotopies, which is if you have an isotopy that's not compactly supported, then you can create or cancel intersections at will. So the question is, what is the appropriate thing to do? And while there's precedence from symplectic dynamics, but really also just experimentation on these examples confirms that this is the right thing to do. So what we'll do is, let me just check my notes to see what my notation should be. So morphisms from L0 to L1 to such Lagrangians will be by definition a direct sum. So it will be just a vector space whose basis is given by intersection points. But instead of taking intersections of L0 and L1, as you might have seen in usual Foucault categories, I will perturb L0 by some diffeomorphism phi. Well, so phi is a diffeomorphism of, let's call this space X, preserving the symplectic form, of course. In fact, it's a Hamiltonian diffeomorphism, which is identity on a compact set, or close to identity on a compact set. And its rotation at constant speed in the cylindrical ends. So what I mean by that is, let's say this was L0, then phi of L0 in here will look essentially the same, but then I will start spinning it around the cylindrical end at a constant rate forever and forever and forever. Okay, so the technical definition for those of you who care about the higher dimensional case, phi is the Hamiltonian diffeomorphism generated by a Hamiltonian which in each cylindrical end is quadratic in the real coordinate. And it's small and generic in the interior. Yes, yes, the time one map. 
I mean, if I change the time, then all I'm doing is I'm changing a little bit the speed at which I spin, but that's all that does is squishing the intersections closer together. It's like a rescaling of the real direction. Okay, so there's not very much happening. Now, the other thing I should point out is people in contact topology care about this a lot because these intersections actually come out of trajectories of the rape vector field from L0 to L1 because this perturbation, what it does is exactly flow by the rape vector field. Okay, so this is related to the rape vector field, uh, to the rape flow. And so in particular, if your non-contact manifold is a cotangent bundle, then this is going to be actually geodesic flow for, well, in, inside the cotangent bundle. If x is g star n, this is going to be geodesic flow. Okay. <coughs> so now, so yes? That is correct. So the main difference, the big difference between this category and usual Fouquet categories is that morphism spaces are infinite dimensional. But see, if you want to be able to talk about this kind of constructions, this is unavoidable. You need, I mean, just because, you know, complex algebraic geometry on non-compact things is intrinsically infinite dimensional. So you need to have an infinite dimensional flavor of symplectic geometry as well. So, um, any, any more questions while we are waiting for this to move up? Is there a reason why you cannot just study cap? Uh, I could study the cap, but it's Fouquet category. It's wrap Fouquet category is trivial, and that's because its mirror has no critical point in its superpotential. So, that's not very interesting for me. Uh, but however, the cap is very interesting when it comes to gluing things because it introduces deformations. But there you rather want to use Seidel's theory of infinity deformations upon compactification. Okay, so now in general, okay, categories have actually a differential which is called the Fleur differential. And what that does is essentially it tries to decide whether pairs of intersections between Lagrangians could be cancelled by Hamiltonian isotopies. And it does that by counting pseudo-holomorphic strips bounded by the two given Lagrangians. Um, well, here, throughout this talk, it turns out that the differential will be zero, so I will save time and not tell you more. Okay. More, in more interesting for me, is the Fleur product, which gives composition in this Fouquet category. And there you will start seeing something that looks a lot like one half of a quantum product on quantum cohomology. If you've never seen Fleur homology before, that's really what it looks like. So to compose morphisms, well, I need given morphisms from L0 to L1 and from L1 to L2 to be able to produce a morphism from L0 to L2. So now these are vector spaces. They have a basis given just by intersection points. So let's just say, let's just say what this does to a pair of intersection points. And what I should get is a linear combination of intersection points between L0 and L2. Okay. So What this does is it has to count holomorphic triangles. So holomorphic maps from a triangle um, with, so in the usual setting, I would just say with boundaries on L0, L1, and L2, but I'm going to change this a little bit. And then I would have intersection points P, Q, and R and I would try to count such holomorphic triangles. 
Okay, so you should think of this as one half of a holomorphic sphere with three mass points. Now in my case, remember I've said that a morphism is actually an intersection point between perturbed copies of these Lagrangians. So if I have L2 here, I should have phi of L1, a pushed around copy of L1. And then this is a valid thing to have. But now if I have this, then I should actually have the image of L0 by phi squared and here the point phi of p, which, so I've just transported everything by the diffeomorphism phi. You shouldn't worry about that. I'm just taking the image of everything by phi. And now the question is, what kind of thing is that? Well, see, this is an intersection of phi squared of L0 with L2, not of phi of L0 with L2, but that exactly brings us back to Youngbin's question. What about the normalization and the multiple? And see, the time two flow of this vector field looks like the time one flow. It just pushes things around a little bit faster. Okay, so I will have to do some explaining. I just wanted to give the definition before we see an example. And it will be clearer with an example. Okay, so Let's look at an example. Let's look inside C star. At just, you know, there's not too many interesting non-compact Lagrangians. So let's look at this guy L0. And let's try to understand what are the endomorphisms of L0 in this VRAP category. Well, so for that I have to look at the image of L0 under this perturbation. So I will take L0, but I will push it slightly like this, and then so this is going to be phi of L0. And then you see that there's intersection points in various places. So let's call this intersection point P0. Let's call this point P1. Let's call this one p negative one. And then, of course, if I come back again, you know, there'll be a p negative two and so on, p two and so on. So as a vector space, this will have infinite rank, and I'm indexing my intersection point by integers. So far, you know, it's not very interesting because there's, I mean, infinite dimensional vector spaces are fine, but without any extra structure, there's not much you can do with it. But now the observation, is that endomorphisms of L0 is actually a ring, or an algebra, I should say. And the question is, what is this algebra? So for that, I need to have three copies of L0, more and more perturbed. And I need to look at these holomorphic triangles. OK, so I need to probably draw this quite a bit bigger. So I have the initial guy L0. Then I have, I seem to be unable to fit more than one. Okay, I need to work harder on that. Yeah, so here there's P minus one. P0, P1, and so on. And then I need to draw, sorry, so this one was phi of L0. And then there's phi squared of L0, which spins around twice as fast. So phi squared of L0, okay, that will be again P0 here. And then it will go around twice as fast. I'm hoping that I'm doing an okay job with that. And so on. Okay. So now let's say that I fix. So what I want to do is I want to look at triangles with one boundary on boundaries on L0. Wait, sorry, this is backwards. This is P of L0, P 
is squared of L0, P of L0, with given corners. Okay, so if I want to compose P and Q, I will put an intersection point P here. No. Sorry. P of P here, Q here, and this is going to be my output. Okay. So if I fix two such intersections, let's say that I look at a point here. So if you keep track of the numbers, this is going to be phi of P1. At least I hope. I mean, actually, yeah, see, phi is just spinning things around. It's the one that's at the same x position as P1. And let's say I want to multiply that with P0. So I want to look for a triangle with white, red, green edges. I guess you can think of an Italian or Mexican flag, if it helps, with corners at these two points. And the answer is there's exactly one, which is over here. Okay, and in fact, for any two intersection points, I will find exactly one. Now, the question is, which one is this one? And the answer is, under stretching again the red guy so that it looks like the green one, this goes back to P1. So this is what I would call P1 tilde. Okay, so in general, you can repeat this as many times as you want, and what you will find is that the rule is that the product of PA with PB is PA plus B. So in fact, I'm going to change my notation, and I'm going to set P sub A equals X to the A, and then I see that endomorphisms of L0 are the algebra C of X, X inverse of Laurent polynomials. Which is kind of interesting because you'd like to see regular functions on C star, on the mirror C star come out of this. Okay. So, let's see. So now the claim is, you know, if you are geometrically oriented, you can repeat this process with other kinds of Lagrangians. I mean, you will quickly run out. There's not too much topology to the cylinder, but still there's a few more. There's circles, for example. And you can repeat the process and try to figure out what will happen. Or if you're algebraically minded, you declare yourself to be done. So why do you declare yourself to be done? So the point is, so we have C star on the symplectic side, and there we have C star but on the algebraic side. And so this one, to make it look more algebraic, I will call it spec C of X, X inverse. Okay, it's an affine algebraic variety whose ring of regular functions is Laurent polynomials. So now what that means is, remember I told you that the Foucault category, the wrapped version, so we'll write wrapped Foucault of C star, should be derived equivalent to coherent sheaves on the mirror C star. Now, I'm not going to lecture you on what a coherent sheaf is, but all I care about for today is that on an affine algebraic variety, this is the same thing as a nice enough finitely presented module over this ring. Okay? So now the question is, ah, okay, so maybe the other way, other thing I should say, is one way of saying this is that this category is generated by O, the trivial complex line bundle, which under this correspondence is the same thing as this ring as a module over itself. And generated means that any other coherent sheaf admits a presentation as a co-kernel of, well, admits a resolution by copies of this guy. That's a basic fact about geometry on C star. Or if you prefer, any module of the ring of Laurent polynomials admits a presentation, admits a resolution by three, by three modules. So that means if you really understand these guys, then you understand everything else because everybody else can be expressed in terms of them. Any object can be resolved as a resolution by 
by copies of O. Ah, I forgot the most, sorry, the most embarrassing information. Sorry, the Rapfouquet categories were defined by Abu Zaid and Seigel, and a lot of the results I will have about them come from the work of Abu Zaid and Seidel. So in particular, one of the results of Abu Zaid and Seidel is that this is generated by this particular object L0 I've drawn for you. So what that means is any other curve can be expressed in terms of that one using mapping codes in the Fouquet category, which I'm not trying to, going to try to convey to you geometrically. There is a geometric interpretation. Essentially, it's a Lagrangian connected sum operation. But so what that means is any Lagrangian can be expressed in terms of that one. So now the question is, how do I go from a Lagrangian submanifold to a module over this algebra? Well, there's a very simple and yet efficient construction called Yoneda embedding that does that for us. It's a general feature for how to go from pretty much any category you like for which you know generating objects into modules over some algebra. So the construction will be, so the natural functor from the Fouquet category of C star two modules over Laurent polynomials. And, well, to make it clearer how it's built, I'm just going to remind you that this is exactly the endomorphisms of L0. And so on objects, all I have to do is, given any Lagrangian L in here, I will map it to hum, uh, let's see, I'm always confused about left or right modules. So if you have a different convention from mine, most likely because of my fault, then you'll have to switch sides. Okay? I'm going to write it this way. So if you want, this is the wrapped floor complex of L0 with L, this vector space generated by intersections. Now, as a vector space, this is fine, but boring. What's more interesting is that this is a module over and the morphisms of L0, just because I can compose a morphism from L0 to itself with one from L0 to L, and I will land in here again. Okay. And then the generation property, the fact that everybody can be understood in terms of L0, implies that this is an embedding of categories. So one way I like to summarize this is, you know, if you want in this Fouquet geometry, you don't want to think of a Lagrangian submanifold as a set of points in your symplectic manifold. You just want to think of it as something that wants to intersect other Lagrangians. And if you understand how a Lagrangian intersects other Lagrangian, then you know everything there is to know about it. Well, intersections and, of course, holomorphic disks that these bound together. And so this is an illustration of this principle. If you know how your given Lagrangian intersects with L0, or rather the perturbed L0, and you know about holomorphic triangles, then you know everything there was to know about your Lagrangian. Okay, and in fact, in this case, you can check this is an equivalence, and this is how you prove mirror symmetry for the cylinder. Okay, questions at this point? Yes? No, there's no super potential on this thing because we're completely in the open case. If we compactified our C star on the symplectic side, say to CP1, for example, then we would equip the mirror C star with a super potential mm -hmm. or vice versa. But if we had a super potential, then we wouldn't push things around infinitely like that. So this is a different flavor of non-compact Fouquet category than the ones that you might have heard about in the presence of superpotentials. <coughs> so another way of saying, actually, this is related to the other one by localization with respect to monodromy. And this is related to the idea that, you know, if you look at the derived category of, say, CP1, which is C star union 
z equals 0 and z equals infinity, how do you go back to c star? Well, you know, a regular function, for example, on c star is the quotient of a regular function on CP1 or a section of some bundle by some multiple, some powers of the defining sections of 0 and infinity. And so what you do is you make the defining equations of the divisor that you want to add here invertible. And I mean, somehow there's a purely homological algebra construction that takes care of that, that expresses the relationship between a compactified version and the uncompactified one, or if you want, things with and without pseudo-potential. So you make it this question, uh -huh. do you impose the pseudo-potential on your open Riemann process? Do you understand what should be the implicit bound? Yes, so, uh, oh, sorry, the question is, do you want to impose this, I mean, do you want to think of this as a complex manifold or as a symplectic manifold? Simplectic. Ah, but so then I would, oh, I see. And But you want to put the pseudo-potential on this side. Uh, on the other side, sure. Oh, okay. Well, then, yes, then this will correspond to a compactification of this Riemann, partial compactification or compactification of this Riemann surface. But, of course, well, the superpotential has to be of the right type. Yeah. Yes. And otherwise, well, I mean, you'll see what kind of trickery I will have if I have time at the end of the talk with, with a pair of pants. Ah, so one more thing I wanted to say, right. So let's imagine that we had no idea that our mirror was going to be C star. Let's say that we were completely blind and we had no idea what the mirror was going to be. Then, you know, we start with this symplectic C star. We study its wrap fouquet category. We find this interesting algebra and we find these modules. And then, well, we remember, oh, wait, this thing is the ring of functions of C star. And that's how we could have recovered in, you know, in a very algebraic perspective that the mirror was supposed to be C star. So in particular, for the pair of pants, you know, well, you might know the answer, but if you haven't seen the few papers that discuss it, you might have no idea what the mirror of a pair of pants looks like. Well, let's try to get started that way, you know, not knowing what the answer will be, just by doing symplectic geometry and guessing the answer. See, you could try to use the SYZ approach, but you would quickly get stuck. There's no nice family of circles that fills the pair of pants. So it doesn't look like it should have a mirror. Still, let's see. So, oops. Okay, so here's the other example the pair of pants. So in the pair of pants, I can look at the following Lagrangians. So I can look at, let's call this one L0, let's call this curve L1, and let's call this curve L2. Okay. So there's a fact, which is again something that follows from Abu Zaid and Seidel, which is that L0, L1, and L2, and in fact you could omit one of the three, but I will keep it for symmetry reason, generate the Wrap Fouquet category of, let's call X this manifold again. I don't have any imagination. So it's enough to understand what things look like for these three particular Lagrangians, and what kind of endomorphism algebra we will get. So, well, we have to compute morphisms between these things. Okay, so the thing to observe is if I look at L0 with itself, the answer will be very much like before, because the image of L0 by perturbation will be something like this. And you see that it intersects itself again in this Z worth of points. There's one thing that's changed. And perhaps to illustrate it, I mean to remind you, you know, see, 
this is that picture from the perspective of L0. Okay, just make a hole here. So it looks like everything is still the same until you realize that if you looked at large enough triangles, for example, there was one whose base would have started out here, probably, and you know keeps going for quite some time. Well, that one used to go over this region as well, and now that's no longer allowed. I mean, this is no longer a valid holomorphic triangle. So in fact, some of the products that used to be equal to something non-zero become zero because I've lost some triangles by making this puncture. And so what happens in this setting is that it's no longer true that if I multiply an x by an x inverse, I will get one. I will get zero instead. So in fact, the positive and the negative powers correspond now to two different variables which multiply to zero. See, I could have thought of this as C of x, y with the relation x, y equals 1. And I'm going to replace that by 0. So of course, then it's no longer the same. <laughs> so I should erase all this. But the calculation is essentially the same as before. And the other observation is that You know, if I look at, say, L0 with L1, so a perfect copy of L0 with L1, then I only get one infinite series of intersections, but not the other one. So there will be only one infinite. So with this, I can now give you the answer about what these endomorphisms look like. So let's say that I have L0, L1, and L2. So the endomorphisms of L0, we've said, should be C of xy with a relation xy equals 0. Here, I will call this C of xz mod xz. That's kind of a gratuitous change of terminology. And this one I will call C of yz mod yz. So secretly what I'm doing is see each set of intersections corresponds to one of the ends. And so I'm calling x powers of x the one that are in this end, L1, L2. These are powers of z and these are powers of y. The advantage of doing this is that now I can tell you also morphisms from L0 to L1, not just as a vector space, but as a module over those guys. So I can tell you, you know, I'm telling you implicitly how to multiply an arrow here with this arrow. And this one is x, c of x. And here, c of y y, c of y, c of z, z, c of z. And, well, time to confess a big lie I've been giving you. Um, what we are dealing with is actually not quite algebra, but rather it's A infinity algebra, in the sense that there are higher products, if you want, corresponding to, like, messy products on chains in algebraic topology. So in fact, there's a higher product, which is going to be the third order product of, so, so the guy I've called one, but going from L0 to L1, one from L1 to L2, one from L2 to L0, is actually identity of E0. And ignore this if you're not into these particular things. Okay, so now the point is, we can try to understand what are the modules of this big algebra. See here, all putting all of these together, I have a big algebra, or rather infinity algebra. So let's call curly A, which is an infinity algebra, consisting of all of these maps together. And the point is, the Vratsuke category of a pair of pants 
embeds by the same construction as before into modules over this algebra. Given any Lagrangian, I look at how it intersects with L0, L1, and L2 and holomorphic triangles, and that tells me everything. So now the question is what kind of algebraic manifold or space or whatever has this kind of algebra built into it? And see, given the way I've presented it to you, it looks like it has these coordinates x, y, and z. So it should have something to do with c cubed. But now if you look a little bit closer, there's something strange going on, which is that if you multiply any two of the coordinates, you will always get zero. No matter where you start, where you end, there's nothing that has more than one non-zero coordinate at a time. So this really looks like the union of the coordinate axes in C cubed with coordinates x, y, z. And in fact, well, I can't really tell you the whole story because I haven't gone into the details of these things, but the mirror is not actually just a space by itself, but rather it's a landau ginzburg model. It's a space carrying one of these super potential functions. And you might observe that C cubed, if I look at it, if I look at the function given by the product x, y, z, then you see that the critical points of W, so that's where all of the partial derivatives vanish, that's exactly where the product of any two of these coordinates vanish, that's exactly the union of the coordinate axis. And so the claim is, this is the mirror of a pair of maths. And see, it was derived kind of, I mean, of course I cheated because I actually knew the answer beforehand, but in principle, I could have kind of guessed the answer just from this calculation. Okay. So questions about this before I try to say more? No? Sorry? Ah, uh, because C star is Calabi-Yau in every possible sense of the word. And you should believe that the pair of pants is not Calabi-Yau. I know that will shock some of you who, I mean, you know, sure, it satisfies the condition that the canonical bundle is trivial. But the issue is that, I mean, so for example, C, its Euler characteristic is minus one. It's not zero. And another problem with it is, well, you know, if I try to build a circle a vibration by circles on it, then I will have some hyperbolic vertex in the middle that will kind of, I mean, anyway, this is a hyperbolic surface. And you should really think of a pair of pants as the simplest example of a curve of general type. So this is, we're actually, and see, the other, the other funny thing is that the dimension is bigger than what we started with. And that's another manifestation of the fact that the pair of pants is pretty exotic as far as mirror symmetry is concerned. So this is actually, you know, I've been kind of piling on many difficulties on top of each other. Things are general type, they're non-compact, and well, that's about it. But so I mean, I can also build actually a mirror to C star, which would be three-dimensional and with a superpotential. Uh, for example, let's see, what could I do? I looked at x, y, z plus x, for example, this would be equivalent to C star, I believe. And that's because this has a Morse bot family of singularities at x equals 0 and y, z equals negative 1, which is a copy of C star. So in fact, I mean, so what I'm going to head towards in the last few minutes is that we can always build mirrors to a very vast class of spaces by looking at landau ginzburg models that have higher dimension than what we start with. And that might be the only option that you have if somehow you can't seem to find a mirror of the same dimension. 
And so in particular, for curves of general type, this is unavoidable just because there's not enough one-dimensional mirrors to go by. And this is kind of one of the first such examples. Okay. So, so maybe what I wanted to point out is what's an approach to building this mirror using an SYZ type story. But before that, any questions about this calculation? So this, sorry, so I didn't really state it as a theorem or anything, but what this proves is Konsevich's conjecture for the pair of pants as a symplectic manifold and this Landau-Ginzburg model as an algebraic space. Yes? Ah, so it's an, it's an excellent question. So almost, except when you have a Landau-Ginzburg model, you should replace coherent sheaves by something deformed by this superpotential. Okay, so in the following sense. So we've said a coherent sheaf, so le let's call R the ring of functions because I will have much of it. So C of X, Y, Z. So a coherent sheaf would just be a module over R. Okay, but I want to incorporate this function into the story. So remember that a usual coherent sheaf would admit a resolution by three modules. So I would have things that are direct sums of copies of R, and I would have maps that I would call maybe let's say D1, and here I would have a map D2, and so on. And the condition would be that D1, D2 should be zero. And instead, so first thing I will do is actually I will want my resolutions to be Z2 periodic. And the reason is that by default, unless we work harder, we only have a Z2 grading. So in fact, we'll be looking at pairs of three modules over R with maps between them, D1 and D2. And the condition we'll want is that D1, D2 is actually W times identity of, well, of one or the other, I'm not sure and D2, D1 is also W times identity. So these are called matrix factorizations of the superpotential because you should think of D1 and D2 as being matrices N1 by N2 or N2 by N1 matrices whose entries are polynomials such that when you multiply them, you get your potential times identity. So it's a factorization of a potential but possibly using matrices rather than just scalars. So that means that matrix factorizations of X, Y, Z plus X and C cubed are equivalent to coherent sheaves on C star and to the Rapukaya of C star as well. Is that, I mean, is that in the derived sense? Uh, yes, probably. Yes, I, yes, I, sh I should probably, yeah, everything should be derived. Yes. So what what we are going to get? Uh, ah, so well, le let let me tell you just now what will happen. So, you know, this is kind of the beginning of a story, where what we can build is given. So in the general construction that we have, but I'm going to stay with the one-dimensional case, if we have a hypersurface or a family of hypersurfaces inside a toric variety, then we can build a mirror to H. So let's say this is complex dimension and this was complex dimension N minus one. The mirror will be a non-compact toric variety together with a superpotential. And if we had a complete intersection, then we would have to raise the dimension even further. And of course, in some cases, like that of C star, we could reduce the dimension back to the expected one, but by default, we have to increase the dimension. So how does one do this, and where does it come from? So the statement is, 
I mean, and so what I mean by mirror here is in the sense of the SYZ story, so with dualities of families of Torah. So certainly this tells you, this mirror being n plus one dimensional, tells you I'm not building a family of Torah on, on, on H or on V, but rather on a larger space, which is geometrically equivalent to H. So one construction I can do is I can look at the blow up of V times C along H times zero. So concretely, when I was telling you about the pair of plants, what I'm actually doing is I'm thinking of a pair of plants as a hypersurface in C star squared. If I look at C star squared, let's call that B, contains at H, <coughs> the hypersurface say X plus Y plus one equals zero. So what that is, is I just take a line in C2, but of course, because I'm in C star squared, I'm removing two points where it hits the coordinate axis, and I end up with a pair of tents topologically. And so X was going to be C star squared times C blown up at the pair of tents times zero. And this is the space on which so this carries a Lagrangian T3 vibration. Or rather, an open subset of this one, which is an open Calabiao, which is actually a conic bundle over C star squared with discriminant. This. Yes, I, what I'm doing is the reverse of everybody else's mirror symmetry. Okay? So in fact, or in fact, X0 contained in X, which is a conic bundle over C star squared is the one that actually carries this vibration. And I can build the SYZ dual vibration, account for instant and corrections, and what I find is that the mirror of X0, so X0 is an open Calabiao threefold. It's a conic bundle over C star squared. And in the SYZ sense, this is SYZ dual two C cubed minus a, hyper, a funny hypersurface in there, a complement of the hypersurface X, Y, Z equals one. And in general, if I repeat this for the marginal case, I will always get the complement of some hypersurface in a toric variety. And then, if I don't care about X zero, but I want really the closed manifold X, sorry, it's not closed, but the slightly less open manifold X. Then I will again get this C3 minus XYZ equals one, but with a superpotential, which is XYZ. Actually XYZ minus one, I believe. Well, let's not worry about that. And then if I care not about X, but about the submanifold H, H sits inside X in many interesting ways, then the claim is H corresponds to, in a way that's no longer quite SYZ, it does SYZ with some stabilization. I will just forget that I wanted to remove this hypersurface. And so there's a more general construction here. So another example that's been popularized, for example, there's a nice, there's a very beautiful paper of Paul Seidel on mirror symmetry for genus two curves. So he's looked at homological mirror symmetry. Question is, what's the mirror of a genus two curve? And it's kind of known to be some threefold threefold, which carries a vibration where, I mean, so it has some superpotential, where the generic fiber is whatever it is, it's some sort of affine K3 surface, but then there's one really, really bad singular fiber that has three components intersecting along three P1s with two triple points. 
And so this is the critical locus. And this configuration of things is the critical locus. And we can construct this exactly by this kind of construction. Namely, we think of a genus 2 curve as sitting inside P1 times P1. And then we take the product of P1 times P1 times C. And we blow that up along the genus 2 curve times 0. And we can build a mirror following the same recipe that gives this. And so on in full generality. So of course, there were already hints. You know, I shouldn't say this is com not completely new. Already, if you read very carefully between the lines of Hori and Vafa's 2000 paper, you see the germs of this construction. Uh, but hopefully, we've made it more geometric and more precise. Oh, yes, sorry. And last thing I wanted to say. So I know that Youngbin has all these constructions of very nice mirrors that tend to be orbifolds, Nando Ginsburg orbifolds. And all that's happening here is the mirrors that I look at always end up being toric Calabia or manifolds and their crepant resolutions of the more singular ones. So, you know, if you believe in all these standard conjectures, um, you know, by the crepant resolution conjectures and others, these Lando Ginsburg orbifolds or the resolutions I'm looking at are the same thing. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much. So if you look, right, so if you have a Vratsuke category, if you take its Horschel homology or cohomology, what you get is this symplectic cohomology, which is the correct replacement of quantum cohomology when you have no superpotential. If you have a superpotential, then you have a slightly different non-compact Fouquet category studied by Seidel, sometimes called Fouquet Seidel. Then you can look at its Horschel homology or cohomology where you have to make a choice. They're not isomorphic anymore. And that has an interpretation, again, in terms of the mirror. But it's more complicated. So I would not look at, instead of gram of Witten variance, I would look at symplectic <coughs> cohomology. So symplectic yeah. cohomology looks at, if you want, the product structure is given by looking at perturbed holomorphic curves. So instead of having marked points, I have marked punctures. And the equation that I have to solve is not del bar u equals zero, but rather del bar u plus the Hamiltonian vector field of the same Hamiltonian I had over there equals zero. So these are perturbed holomorphic curves. It's a, it's a perturbed version of gromov witten theory that includes this Hamiltonian. So this was first introduced, I believe, by Viterbo. And Seidel has written a lot about the relation between this and Fouquet categories. Yeah. 